Hey brothers and sisters, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, my name is Carlos, um, my channel, Son of Manasseh, and you are going through the next video in the Jacob 5 series. This is uh, titled The Scattering. Um, if you haven't seen my prelude or my intro, um, make sure you go back and check it out. I feel that it sort of gives people a... Um, a bit of a background about how I approach my work and then also what to expect uh, when you go through this Jacob 5 series. I know that a lot of people have been interested in it so um, feel free to go and check that one out before moving on through this. Okay so Jacob 5, the scattering, um, there's a lot to cover so we're going to dive straight into it and we're just going to power right through it. Okay so first off I put together a bit of a legend. A lot of you that are familiar with my work know that I use certain um, colors but um all the all the purple boxes are going to be um, scriptures, so um, and this is this is scriptures that are from the allegory and also scriptures that I feel tie into the allegory to give us a bit more insight and depth and understanding. Um, the next part is this these purple boxes. Oh, I don't know what is that blue or a dark some grape color or whatever. No, that's more of a grape color. I don't even know what this is. Okay. This, this bluish color, um, that's that's instructions in the allegory. So I feel it was one of the most important things when trying to understand this this allegory was to separate um, certain times where um, where there was actions done and then where there was a bit of back and forth conversation between the servant and then the master of the vineyard. So we have, I've separated it out so that all the all these purple boxes are where um, where there was actual actions taking place in the allegory, and then the, these these other bluish color boxes are where there was a bit of back and forth um, discussing what they were going to do. Um, as you know, that this this middle section here is is my spine. I usually have a spine um, scripture that I work with. So this middle part along here is is the Jacob 5 and then everything outside of that on both sides is sort of explaining and breaking it down okay um, these this peachy color they are quotes from keys prophets um, both present and past and then also um, straight from student manuals so Book of Mormon New Testament Old Testament Doctrine and Covenants whatever I've, I've studied and feel ties into the scriptures um, I'll be I'll be using these okay so these other ones are new I haven't used them before but the this this greenish color um, they are historical events and time so a lot of people I feel if you're not wanting to dive um, to deep dive with me into into all of this a lot of people will probably be most interested in these where we are able to look at a certain um, scripture in the allegory and then we're able to tie it to a certain event. So I go throughout the whole series and we'll, and we'll tie it to certain events, as you'll see. And that's going to be placed um, always on this right-hand column. Uh, sorry, left-hand column. And um, you'll, you'll see as we go through it, it'll be... Um, I think it will be quite useful for people to be able to get an understanding about what the allegory is representing in terms of an event that has taken place in the past okay and then also events um, in the future as well and then this yellow one is horticultural principles so I um, I've been doing a lot of research on Jacob 5 right and there was a, there's quite a lot of information out there but there was this one article that was written uh, and it's in Book of Mormon Central. I don't particularly follow Book of Mormon Central, but there was this one article that they wrote, which I found was really, really insightful. It was, it was quite good. And it was pretty much a couple of um, people that know olive trees. They, they've, they've either worked with olive trees, or they've studied them, or they know everything about them, and how to maintain, and how to grow, and how to... Um, to nurture all that stuff to do with olive trees so they went through the Jacob 5 allegory and then they tied it back to how people would actually deal with the olive tree what they found out was that every point was bang on the money 
when it came to um, when it came to describing what the what happened in the allegory and then the tying it back to what they would actually do so as you see there's these yellow boxes I've got them on the right hand side and they're going to be um, you know in a few places where I feel that it might give a little bit more insight as to why the master of the vineyard said certain things and why they did certain things okay and then last and probably the least is these gray boxes and that's my own words okay so you'll see that where I feel like I give a little bit of commentary um, a lot of people in the past have requested my um, to have my uh, like a, a JPEG of all of these presentations but I haven't put much commentary into it so it hasn't had much context so I've put you know some of these gray boxes and you'll see them all throughout okay all right so moving on so in um, there's a few places where they create where they've produced a table um, that breaks down the possible meanings so even these guys aren't sure right but possible meanings of the allegory of the olive tree certain elements to it um, you'll see that the the Book of Mormon student manual and they've got um, the seminary teacher manual they're all slightly different and they all have different uh, interpretations I've taken the Book of Mormon seminary teacher manual because I found it was the best okay so just keep in mind when you're studying it you're gonna see a little bit of variation to it okay so let's go through this real quick the tame olive tree is the house of Israel or God's covenant people the vineyard is the world decay represents sin and apostasy the Lord and master of the vineyard is Jesus Christ pruning digging and nourishing is the Lord's efforts to help people receive the blessings of salvation and the servant or the, of the master of the vineyard is the Lord's prophets branches equals groups of people the wild olive tree are Gentiles those who have not made covenants with the Lord later in the allegory natural or tame olive trees become wild representing portions of the house of Israel that fall into apostasy grafting and planting branches equals the scattering and gathering of the Lord's covenant people in addition the grafting of wild branches into the tame olive tree represents the conversion of those who become part of the Lord's covenant people so I, I um, when I go through all of this there's things that I agree with that's just like, okay that's pretty straightforward but there's certain things that I say okay well yeah maybe but um, maybe not maybe there's a little bit more that we could pull out of um, making this make sense in the allegory okay so so for example here grafting and planting a lot of people feel that this is this is just referring to um, to this the spiritual grafting which in most cases it is but it also is a temporal thing so when the Lord's um, moving branches it, he he is he is in times um, destroying the branches if they're wicked but sometimes he's not moving them from the covenant he's just moving them because um, to, to well to preserve the branches to preserve certain certain people right uh, obviously Lehi was one of them so you know we can see that not everything is bang on okay so we've got to sort of have a bit of flexibility in this burning branches equals God's judgments on the wicked the fruit the lives or works of people um, real interesting this one and I want to put a bit of emphasis on this because we're going to be diving into this one a little bit later the lives or works of people natural or tame fruit represents righteous works wild fruit represents unrighteous works and then the last one is roots equals individuals with whom the Lord covenanted anciently such as Abraham Isaac and Jacob roots may also represent the covenants the Lord makes with those who follow him so um, there's obviously two different things here in the Book of Mormon student manuals they leaned more to um, the roots representing the covenants to the uh, 
the covenants the Lord makes with those who follow him. Okay, so I I in this series, as I've gone through my studies, I I can see there's more sense when the roots represent the covenants the Lord has extended to his people. Okay, so that's that's what I'm going to be breaking down in great depth um, a little bit later. But you can also see that these two are sort of associated with each other. So for example, a lot of the covenants that have been made available to us are because of the covenants that the Lord ultimately made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so um, keep that in mind as we move forward. But I mean, these these are like like what this um, the Book of Mormon student, uh, sorry, seminary teacher manual says. These are possible meanings. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of flex in these definitions. All right. Now, a lot of you that have studied the Book of Mormon. Um, student manuals when trying to understand Jacob 5 you guys would have seen this all right I um, this is a really really generalized massive overview of the whole allegory it doesn't go into much depth but it gives just sort of like a a, a basic rundown of what happened uh, but not really interpret what it actually meant okay so I I, I subscribe to all of these ideas and I think that they are um, they are pretty much bang on okay so what I will do is I'll probably use this at the start of all my videos not to go into in great depth but um, just to just to sort of give a bit of a okay this is where we're at all right so as you as you can tell um, there's there's four different sections there's a the scattering there's the time of Christ the great apostasy and then the gathering of Israel so we're going to be covering the gathering, right? Which is verses right from the start all the way to verse 14, okay? And then obviously they they give a breakdown about what happened, the tree, the olive tree, what was going down with it, and then what the Lord stepped in and did with it, okay? Which is basically burn the branches, graft in the wild olive tree, branches from the wild olive tree, and then um, take off with these these little branches and go plant them somewhere else okay so that's that's what we're going to be diving into Jacob 5 the scattering uh, what else is there now nah, that's it all right you ready to go let's get into it so Jacob quotes Zenos relative to the allegory of the of the tame and wild olive trees they are a likeness of Israel and the Gentiles the scattering and gathering of Israel are prefigured Allusions are made to the Nephites and Lamanites and all the house of Israel. The Gentiles will be grafted into, in, into Israel. Eventually the vineyard will be burned. <clears throat> Verse 1. Behold my beloved brethren, do you not remember to have read the words of the prophet Zenos, which he spake unto the house of Israel, saying, Hearken, O you house of Israel, and hear the words of me, a prophet of the Lord. Um, so just a side note. I'll usually um, bold certain like phrases or certain words as a as a point of interest, and then what I'll do is I'll, there'll be arrows that will be connected to those phrases or those these words that I've that I've bolded, where I give a little bit of a breakdown. Okay, so hearken, ye house of Israel, and hear the words of me, a prophet of the Lord. So these are my words. Who's he talking to? This allegory is given for all the house of Israel, those of blood lineage, as well as those that have been adopted in by covenant. So we're going to be um, touching more on this later. All right. Uh, verse 3. For behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, like unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard, and it grew and waxed old and began to decay. Okay, so... Here's this tree, right? It was it was planted, it was nourished in the vineyard, and it did three things. It grew and it waxed old. Whoa. It grew, it waxed old, and it began to decay. Okay. So um I've gone through and heard a lot of different people and what they interpreted that to mean. Um Hugh Nibley and uh Hiram Andrus actually as well. They, they tied this event here 
to Israel's state in Egypt, right? So I I disagree with that, and I'll show you why. Um, we dive into the botanical aspects of the olive culture. Um, this is that Book of Mormon central thing that I was talking about before. Let's see what they say. Verse 3 describes the typical life cycle of the olive tree. Planted, nourished, grew, waxed old, began to decay. There are many ways to rejuvenate old trees, and thus the Lord of the vineyard would have many options in trying to preserve his beloved tree. I've put pruning as one. Most species of trees grow to a certain size, then age and die. However, many trees may be propagated vegetatively. New shoots and suckers can reinitiate the, the cycle of growth. This principle is used to rejuvenate old olive trees. So there's this constant pruning that's going on in the, um, that these guys would do with olive trees to help produce new branches, to help produce new wood that would help to that would help to produce um, just to kick the the um, the olive tree back into gear to produce more fruit and this is what they actually did okay so the lord stepped in the well, the lord's like he's he's seen this this thing that's taken place but it's just like well how what does it mean and how can we tie it back to what's actually happened and to certain events that took place okay so Old Testament student manual, Kings, Malachi, the divided kingdoms, right? This is what it says. Saul was chosen as the first king, and under his leadership, the foundations of the kingdom were laid. The land was united and greatly strengthened under the kingship of David. Finally, under Solomon, Israel reached its greatest glory and its greatest expansion. It grew and became its greatest during Solomon. The first three kings of Israel achieved many significant things, but their worldly government cultivated the seeds of the of the destruction that was to come upon the nation. And that's the end from the Old Testament student manual. So think about it. <clears throat> As Israel grew, which obviously Israel's always grown since since you know Jacob and all of his kids grew up and you know became men had families of their own it's always been growing right but there was a state where it, it sort of went through the cycle of reaching its its prime or reaching its max in terms of greatness in terms of expansion in terms of what it was able to achieve and then from that point onwards it started to slide and went downhill and that was tied to King Solomon onwards and I've put there uh, 1015 BC onwards okay so <clears throat> now a lot of these years that we've put here based based on where you look in um, in LDS or the the um, sorry the Church of Jesus Christ the on the website you'll see different um, you know in enzymes and stuff different years that they put out and usually there's roughly a, around about a 50% buffer or a 50%, sorry, a 50%, a 50 year difference in how they calculate all of these years. And the reason why that is, is because in the Bible, we have an account that gives a, a, um, a bit of a, a chronological um, estimation of all the years, but then also like they had an Assyrian account as well. And so based on whatever you see, it might these years might be a little bit different. But I think the main point is roughly around this time, King Solomon onwards with 1015 BC, this is what took place, okay? <clears throat> so then in, uh, while Solomon was king, he starts building his temple. And it, it took him from 1012 all the way to uh, 9, 991 BC. So roughly about 20 years it took them to build this temple. Now a lot of you will know that when that temple was built, there was that was the biggest and the most glorious temple that they've ever had, right? Once that was destroyed, that was it. It was just like um, the 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 next versions were just mini versions of what they had at that stage during Solomon's time. Okay, so once again, it just shows that that Israel hit its prime um, in a temporal 
in a temporal state they had its prime around about this time okay all right now obviously obviously um you know moses was 1567 bc and then abraham well, the fourth dispensation was 1992 so 1992 bc was abraham okay cool let's move on verse 4 and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth and he saw that his olive tree began to decay and he said i will prune it and dig about it and nourish it that perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches and it perish not so he he stepped in and he could see that this thing was happening to his tree to the house of israel and then obviously he took place or like he took initiative to start intervening to help them to or to help the tree do something that it couldn't do on its own okay so i've tied this this period here verse 4 to the period of the kings right so um because pretty much of wickedness the um from solomon's son onwards the kingdoms were split right into a north kingdom and a south kingdom we've got uh, the kingdom of israel in the north and then we've got the kingdom of judah in the south and that happened in 975 bc so from that period onward we've got the period of the kings okay so i've tied that to this period here in verse 4. so let's break this down uh first nephi 17 30 and now and notwithstanding they've been led the lord their god their redeemer going before them leading them by day and giving light unto them by night and doing all things for them which were expedient for man to receive they hardened their hearts and blinded their minds and reviled against moses and against the true and living god okay so it's not like it's not like the master of the vineyard did this on a one-off occasion he was always doing this right he was always doing this for the people he was always pruning digging about and nourishing his tree or his people so then the question you you want to ask is okay well what do these things represent what does what does it mean when the lord intervenes with the tree and then he prunes it and he digs about it and then he nourishes it a lot of people will just say oh it's just the lord caring for his people but there's more to the picture guys and we need to break it down okay so in order for like i mean like when i was studying this i was just like okay obviously the lord did, did these things there were some times where he might have only just dug about it or or nourished it but didn't prune it so there were and then this is in the allegory by the way so then these things must represent something and obviously there's not much out there where leaders of the church have gone and said okay guys so when the lord said he's going to dig about the tree this is what it meant we, we're not able to rely on that on that information because no one said anything about it okay so then what i did is i went back to um i went back to basics and tried to break down okay well what why would why would an olive tree grower i don't know is that the term someone who grows olive trees let's put it that way why would they do these things and what and what purpose does it have and when you dive into to that sort of angle you're able to pick up a lot more information as to what this could potentially mean when the lord steps in and does this thing okay so follow this dotted arrow and we move into this another little section called pruning digging about and nourishing all right so let's touch on pruning first all of the fruit of the olive is born on second year wood and the same wood does not bear again for this reason a new crop of shoots each year is necessary for a fruit set i don't know that by the way with proper management trees can be stimulated to produce young shoots xenos refers repetitively to the process of priming to stimulate fruit bearing in order to obtain fruit production each year an olive grower must prune annually there are a number of pruning procedures which include lowering reduction crowning pollarding cutting back and undercutting 
growers must carefully calculate the amount of wood to remove, requiring the pruner to be expert at his work. The principal branches on different ages are preserved only for a short period of production and then are suppressed in favour of younger branches. All of these pruning methods concentrate on making young and tender branches shoot forth so there is second year wood for fruit production. I thought that was crazy because, man, I suck at trees. I don't know anything about trees. Um, I just know how to maybe build a fort in a tree or a tree house, but that's about it. <laughs> that's my extent of trees. Um, they're cool to climb. There we go. So... Uh, I, I thought it was it was really interesting because why do we have an olive tree in the first place? Right? You could say, um, well, it's beautiful to look at. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so it is beautiful to look at, but there's more of a reason to have an olive tree or a fruit tree, right? And that is because we want to get the fruit. So if the tree ain't, pre pre um, if the tree ain't producing fruit, we've got problems. We need to step in and we need to um, go ahead and do whatever it takes so that this tree starts to produce fruit. This is why we prune, okay? So if if the branches are groups of people and they're not producing fruit, we've got to go and do whatever to these branches to so that they can start producing fruit. And this is what the Lord's doing, right? Giving the people the opportunity to produce fruit and if they ain't producing fruit, he's got to step in and and start pruning so that eventually they do, right? So now my words on this. So pruning equals cutting back branches, leaves, and thinning out. Referring to placing burdens on Israel, becoming a vassal nation, or becoming subject to, to other nations. So paying taxes, that was one of the, the main things that these guys ended up doing kind of reminds me about what we're doing right now but anyways trials such as plagues pestilence famine wars are uh, all for the purpose yeah all for the purpose of humbling israel right to see if the tree would start to do its job what's the job to produce fruit in addition pruning can have reference to destroying wickedness removing those that reject the lord and reject his covenants Alma 34, 16. Therefore, blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. Or rather, in other words, blessed is he that believeth in the word of God and is baptized without stubbornness of heart, yea, without being brought to know the word or even compelled to know before they will believe. Right? You, you know that a lot of the state of ancient Israel they were in the state of stubbornness of heart. And so what did the Lord do? He put them in difficult situations so that they could humble themselves and believe in the Lord and believe in Jehovah and believe in um, the prophecies and believe in the covenants. But these guys were idiots. They chose, they, you know, we, we know what happened. They chose different paths and they just wouldn't listen, right? <clears throat> so that's nourishing. Oh, sorry, that's pruning. Uh, nourishing. Fertilizing an olive tree is essential to good productivity. The amount of fertilizer used should be determined for each case based on soil, climate, situation of the tree, tree age, cultivar, growth, and other factors. So I've put this as pretty easy. Nourish equals profit, uh, keys, you could put priesthood in there, and the word of God. So these these authorized servants who step in and distribute the word of God to the people. Okay, <clears throat> And we've got heaps of scriptures that tie into that. Let's go through Moroni 6 verse 4. And after they had been received unto baptism and were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, they were numbered among the people of the church of Christ, and their names were taken that they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God. So the good word of God is what nourishes them. Okay, <clears throat> To keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watchful unto prayer, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who was the author and finisher of their faith. So how does the word of God nourish us? Okay, 
Alma 32, 42. And because of your diligence and your faith and your patience with nourish, well, uh, sorry, with the word and nourishing it, meaning that the word nourishes us, but we also have a part to play in nourishing it as well. Uh, continuing on, that it may take root in you. Interesting word, root. That it may take root in you. Behold, by and by you shall pluck the fruit. Okay, so the 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 result of having the word nourish us is that it helps this fruit to grow, right? So what's this fruit? <clears throat> to pluck the fruit thereof, which is most precious, which is sweet above all that is sweet, and which is white above all that is white, yea, and pure above all that is pure. And ye shall feast upon this fruit, even until you are filled, that ye hunger not, neither shall ye thirst. All right. <clears throat> Alma 33, 23. And now, my brethren, I desire that ye shall plant this word in your hearts, and as it beginneth to swell, even so nourish it by your faith. All right. Our duty. And what's the fruit? And behold, it will become a tree springing up unto you everlasting life. <clears throat> right. That's the eventual fruit. And then may God grant unto you that your burdens may be light through the joy of his son. And even all this can you do if you will. All right. So if we go back to um, to what we spoke about earlier up here. The fruit is the lives or works of people. Natural fruit represents righteous works. Wild fruit represents unrighteous works. So when we start... Um, having this word being planted in us and we nourish the word and the word eventually nourishes us our natures change and we start to do righteous works when we start to do righteous works we're producing this fruit right um, so going back to where are we okay so to summarize nourishing we are nourished by the good word of God but we have a role to play as well. We need to nourish the word through our diligence, our faith and patience And all these verses here. Break that one down. It needs to be planted in our hearts. So there's this back and forth, right? There's us and then there's the word. We, the word is planted in our hearts, right? And we nourish the word and then in turn, it nourishes us and we start to produce fruit, okay? <clears throat> So I found it interesting that um, out of Bedna in his last in the last conference being April 2022, he gave a really awesome talk. I loved it. And he started to break down um, the word, the iron rod. And he also uh, gave another another interpretation of the word being Jesus Christ. okay so when we this it all applies when we put his words in us then then we start and, and then we nourish that word right we become more like him that's really in essence what we're saying here okay <clears throat> so uh that was pruning that was nourishing and then the last one is to dig about what does it mean when the lord says okay i'm going to dig about the tree well what's the purpose of digging and are you digging the actual tree or are you digging the soil? Okay, so why should olive trees be dug about? In simple terms, it is necessary to loosen the soil to make nutrients and moisture available to the roots. Okay, so we're talking about the roots. When we dig about the tree, it's to do with the roots. Okay, so because the upper layers of soil tend to tie up phosphates and potash, potash, they often do not reach the feeder roots unless the soil is disturbed. So we dig about the tree to make nutrients available to the roots. Well, if the roots are the covenants, what would that represent? So to dig about equals to break up the soil to allow nutrients to get to the roots of the tree equals re-establishing or re-extending the everlasting covenant between God and man. Okay, so... Um, 
we can do a whole section on this alone and i probably i'm going to dive probably dive into the everlasting covenant uh, maybe in the next section so bear with me because there's heaps of stuff that happen with the roots in this allegory all throughout it, it's talking about the roots okay and so i feel that we need to um we need to get a proper understanding about the everlasting covenant and how that ties into the roots so that we've got so that we're able to move forward in the allegory and and know that when there's something happening with the roots we're able to know what's what it's talking about okay so we'll, we'll touch on that um in probably the next video all right back on verse five and it came to pass that he pruned it and digged about it and nourished it according to his word so he did all of those things that we are talking about and when did he do this was this just a one-off thing no, it was a process. If you think about like when the kingdom split 975 in the period of the kings, he was doing this the whole time. And this is a period of around about 500 years, by the way. 400? 500. Just under 500 years. There was this constant pruning, digging about, and nourishing. Meaning pruning um, the, the burdens that were placed on Israel to try and get it to change its ways digging about, re-extending uh, the, these covenants that were that were administered through the servants to the people, and usually it was to the kings, okay? And then and then nourishing it, um, having the word be distributed also through the servants, okay? So the servants had a huge part to play in this, or the prophets. Verse 6, and it came to pass, after many days, it began to put forth somewhat a little young and tender branches. But behold, the main top thereof began to perish. Okay, so after many days, when we see in the scriptures, especially in, in um, parables and allegories like this one, when we see after many days, it's not literally meaning, okay, maybe three or four days, something else happened. It it's referring to this could be years or decades or even centuries right where um one verse can cover just years upon years okay so so i've put in here after many days this is code for many years decades centuries the periods of the kings were almost 500 years okay so after many days uh, these young and tender branches began to spring forth. When did this happen? Well, it's actually hard to it's hard to tell. We know that it happened right before the scattering, but did it happen any other times? Probably, most likely. But I mean, to to narrow that down to a certain event is really really difficult. We know a hundred percent that right before the scattering happened, that these young and tender branches were taken by the lord okay so that's one thing that we could lock in for sure but behold the main top thereof began to perish so what's the main top right jeremiah 22 and under the um i don't know what do you call this the the synopsis or like the the uh subheading this is what it says david's throne stands or falls according to the obedience of the kings the judgments of the Lord rest upon the kings of Judah. And so this is what Jeremiah was saying. Thus saith the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word. And, and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sittest, sittest upon the throne of David. Thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Three, uh, verse three. Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness. And deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do and do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow. Neither shed innocent blood in this place. So he's he's laying down the law. <clears throat> and this and then verse five. But if you will do, if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. Okay, so. If you've studied the um, the history of ancient Israel, you'll know that a lot of these guys succeeded and fell based on 
what these guys did. These guys at the top, right? So the top, the main top, I tie into being the kings, being the royalty, being the leaders of the of that people. And what did they do? Time and time again, they stuffed it up. Okay, so the main top or the main branches. And there's a few more verses that tie into this, which show that it that it it is the top. The top is the kings, and and these main branches are these kings um, that control Israel, right? So this top thereof began to perish. Well, what does it mean when this top began to perish, right? Um, let me get rid of that began to perish my bad began to perish versus began began to decay right let me get rid of this this thing out of the way All right let's do it so began to decay equals to rot and decompose. What was causing the tree to rot or decompose? Because before up here it says, uh, where does it say it? Where does it say it? So yeah, it says it began to decay here, began to decay and then began to perish. Okay. So began to decay is to rot or decompose. What was causing the tree to rot or decompose? What was Israel's Achilles heel? The answer is idolatry, right? And we've got Joshua 23, verses 15 and 16. The Lord bring upon you all evil things until he hath destroyed you from off this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. When ye have transgressed the covenant, right, these roots, when ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them. Then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given you. So a question How often did Israel struggle with idolatry? Uh pretty much since the get go, and it was always, right? And a lot of the times, why did they do it? Why did they struggle with idolatry? Because these clowns at the top were doing it, right? They were the ones that were getting it and then distributing this practice amongst the people, okay? And then once it was in, it was a struggle to get rid of, okay? So that's that's what I've tied to um, beginning to decay. Idolatry had been plaguing Israel since leaving Egypt and continue to do so in the land of Canaan. The Lord specifically warned against idolatry on several occasions and even commanded the Israelites, let's just say, to never do it, ever, <laughs> ever. Did they listen? <laughs> no, because they never listen. Well, a lot of the times they didn't listen, right? So it began to perish equals die. So this is the these are actual um, Google definitions. Die, meaning once that was set up, they started opening up into some crazy, crazy, crazy things, right? Some of these guys, these guys were sacrificing. These guys were just doing just the most horrible stuff. They were reaching a point of no return. And I've tied that into being sealed up by the devil, right? So, um, Alma 34, which is a really interesting verse. For behold, if ye have procrastinated the day of your repentance, even until death, behold, ye have become subjected to the spirit of the devil, and he doth seal you his. Therefore the spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you, and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you. And this is the final state of the wicked. So when the master of the or the Lord of the vineyard steps in and he starts intervening with the tree, he's trying to prevent this from happening. Why? Because once you reach this state, it's a state of no return. Okay, they, these guys were constantly reaching a state where they could not, they could not escape the state that they were in. The spirit had with, with, had withdrawn, right, and they were left to themselves, not because 
not because the Lord wanted to, but because they just they just wouldn't listen, right? And because they were in that state, they were reaching a point of no return. So that's verse six. Uh, now there's a bit of back and forth with these blue boxes here. Um, verse seven, and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard saw it, and he said unto his servant, "It grieveth me that I should lose this tree." Right. So it's causing the Lord to grieve that he should lose this tree. Wherefore, go and pluck the branches from a wild olive tree and bring them hither unto me and we will pluck off those main branches which are beginning to wither away and we will cast them into the fire that they may be burned. Right. So these main branches, they're reaching the point of no return. They're starting to wither away. There's nothing we can do apart from breaking them off from the tree and that they may be burned. We want to break them off because we don't want them to affect everyone else right everyone else that has a chance we want to give them the best chance that we can but these guys these main branches that are stuffing it up we want to get rid of them all right for the purpose of preserving the tree so i i have um, a few things that i want to break down here first his servant i know that it said that the servants are the prophets but i think that there's a little bit more to this right if the servants are the prophets who was this this particular servant I believe this is Moses. This was his dispensation and he held the key. So that's the reasons why. Okay, Even though he was long gone, translated by this stage, he could potentially be working behind the scenes to help Israel. So the servant was the one that was commanded to, um, to help intervene with bringing the Gentiles in and grafting them into this, into this tree. Okay, So I believe that this is tied to uh, to Moses. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. There's a scripture mastery there for you. Um, it grieveth me. Let's break this one down a little bit. It grieveth me. My words. Why would losing the tree, the house of Israel, cause the Lord to grieve? This is my answer. The Lord has covenant which tie directly to the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that were made with Abraham and then extended to Isaac and Jacob because of their righteousness, right? Key point there. Whether we, um, whether we, you know, regardless of whatever actions we took, these covenants were extended to us because of them and what they did, Okay really interesting point so although there was a lot of wickedness um in in uh, the house of israel the literal house of israel these covenants and these blessings were extended to them because of their forefathers put simply if the lord lost the tree he would no longer be able to fulfill his promises to them right another reason what other reasons would cause the lord to grieve over losing the tree this tree has a history that extends beyond our mortal probation in both directions. Through obedience and devotion to God, many became Israel in the pre-mortal realm where God extended eternal covenants and where duties and callings were established. Make no mistake, where and when we are born is by design. It would make sense that the Lord would grieve when he sees his chosen people <clears throat> They, his chosen people, guys, they come to earth, right, and they fall from that state that they were in. They fall from what they 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 promised to do. They fall from um, from their calling and their election, but come out and you know, sorry, they don't. They not only fall from their calling and election, but they come out in open rebellion to their God. And this was the case during this period of time in the history of the house of Israel. So I've got a few um, a few quotes to back that one up. Let's dive into uh, Bruce Simon Conkey. Quote, Israel as an eternal people. Israel as an eternal people. What does that mean, guys? <clears throat> Members of that chosen race first gained their inheritance with the faithful in the pre-mortal life. Israel was a distinct people in pre, uh, people in pre-existence. Many of the valiant and noble spirits in that first estate were chosen 
elected and foreordained to be born into the family of Jacob so as to be natural heirs of all of the blessings of the gospel. Uh, let's go uh, to this one. Those born to the lineage of Jacob, who were later to be called Israel and his posterity, who were known as the children of Israel, were born in the most illustrious lineage of any of those who came upon the earth as mortal beings. That's a pretty huge statement right there. All these rewards were seemingly promised or foreordained before the world was. Surely these matters must have been determined by the kind of lives we had lived in the pre or in the pre-mortal spirit world. Some may question these assumptions, but at the same time they will accept without any question the belief that there that each of each one of us will be judged when we leave this earth according to his or her deeds during our lives here in mortality. Isn't it just as reasonable to believe that what we have received here in this earth life was given to each of us according to the merits of our conduct before we came here? Question mark. Close quote. That's Harold B. Lee uh, from conference in 1973. So let's wrap that one up. What does that mean? It means that we were all judged before we came here to earth based on our faithfulness and our obedience. That in turn determined where, when, and who we came down as. Okay, so <clears throat> many people will probably think that this whole where and when and who, what family we get assigned to when we come down to earth, the Lord just rolls a dice and shakes it, and then what we come out like, you know, that's there's no order to it. It's just sort of everyone goes where they go, and that's it. But guys, that's wrong. That's not true at all. Everything has order. The Lord always has order to how he does things. When, where, and who we come down with is by design. Okay. Sorry, I was just having a drink. All right. One more, one more um, quote. The Lord has reminded you, your children and your grandchildren, that ye are lawful heirs that you have been reserved in heaven for your specific time and place to be born, to grow and become his standard bearers and covenant people. And that's from the future of the church, preparing the world for the Savior's second coming, present now since 2020. Okay, so so let's, let's wrap this whole, the Lord grieveth, right? If we, like I said in the, in the prelude, if we were just to remove the veil, right? And we were to see who we really are. I guarantee you, you would definitely change how you feel about yourself. Now, you will you will change um, the things you do with your time. Now, I reckon that if I was to remove the veil right now, I'd probably slap myself because I am more than what I am. Or I'm more than what I'm playing out to be here, right now, in mortality. Okay? You need to understand your worth to the Lord. You are His covenant people. These guys were His covenant people, right? And it was because of the things that happened. The things that happened in this pre-earth state, okay? Uh, um, also, that a really interesting point is we were judged in the pre-earth life right and that determined where and when we've come down so we've been reserved now for this the final stages the showdown right we've been reserved for this specific time why did the lord reserve you what was it about you like have you even run the numbers run run the numbers man about the 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 chances of being reserved into the last days and to be born in the covenant or to be adopted in the covenant, right? Either way, the end result was the same. Whether you're born or adopted in, it is the same, okay? But just maybe take some time to ponder on that, especially especially if you struggle with self-worth, which I know is pretty rampant, um, even to members in the church. If you struggle with self-worth, it's because you don't know who you are. If you know, If you knew who you were, immediately those things would go because 
the Lord, the Lord. We're his people. We're his family, right? Uh, okay. Main branches beginning to wither away. Um, cast in the fire that they may be burned. Okay, so these, these main branches, got to get rid of these main branches, guys. Why? Because they're withering away. Why? They're, they're reaching a point of no return. The Lord destroys the wicked and rebellious Israelites and allows the remainder to be exiled before grafting in the Gentiles. So this is a temple graft and a spiritual graft. Okay, so we're going to dive into that uh, in one of the next few verses. Verse 8. And behold, saith the Lord of the vineyard, I take away many of these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. And it mattereth not if it so be that the root of this tree will perish. I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. Wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. Okay, so a couple of things I want to break down there. It was vital to scatter the young and tender branches, because otherwise they would have become corrupted or destroyed by the main branches of the tree. So what does that look like? How many times can we read in the scriptures where where the prophets were threatened with their lives, right? Just look at Lehi. They tried to kill him. And I'm just like, bro, why would you want to try to kill that guy? He's an old guy. He's not threatening you. Like, he's not a threat to you. The only reason why you want to kill him is because you don't like what he's saying. But he's not actually threatening your life or anything, right? It just goes to show the state that they were in. Okay, so um, I will take, I will take. Future tense for removing them from Canaan. How long did Lehi chill in the wilderness before reaching the promised land? First Nephi 18 is where we find that answer. So about 591. So r roughly... These branches were taken and there was this 10, you could say a 10 year layover, right? A 10 year uh, um, period of time before they're actually taken and grafted or planted, right? And I'll dive into that one here. I will graft them whithersoever I will. Um, these are temporal grafts and can refer to both grafting, meaning moving a group of people and having them cohabit with another people, i.e. the ten tribes to the Assyrians. Or uh, this could also refer to planting the branch and it eventually becoming a tree of its own. So, for example, taking Lehi and his crew and planting them in America to become their own people or their own natural tree, which is um, we'll be diving into probably in a couple of videos later. Okay, So... There is no difference, right? Um, and you know what as well? Because we know that Lehi was one of these branches, it, it that shows us a pattern of what this stuff means when we apply it to the other branches, okay? <clears throat> so we'll see more on that later on. All right, verse 9. Take thou the branches of the wild... So this is, this is the master of the vineyard. He's giving instructions to his servant, okay? Take thou the branches of the wild olive tree and graft them in, in the stead thereof. And these which I have plucked off, I will cast into the fire and burn them, that they may not cumber the ground of my vineyard. Okay, so a few things to break down there. Um, there's a there's a bit of back and forth here. They're, they're, they're having a chat about what they're going to do, right? Um, the Lord is saying to him, I'm going to pluck these pluck these branches off that are wicked these these main branches these kings these people that are um, doing wickedness and they're not listening and they're of that point that where there's there's just no hope for them right they cannot escape the chains of the devil because he's got all power over them right and, and that's not to say that's not to say by the way that the Lord can't rescue them it's just that like like the atonement is not enough for them the atonement can cover everyone and everything it is an eternal covenant right it is sorry it's an eternal atonement it is it is from um never ending to never ending but but because of the everlasting chains because 
the devil has sealed them, they can no longer escape the power of the devil that he has over them because he they surrender their will to him. Okay, so I got to I got to really um, make a distinction there. Uh, so they're plucked off. So there's this process of plucking off these branches. Once they're plucked off, then the um, the wild olive branches are going to be placed or grafted in in the stead thereof. Okay. Uh, and then and we're going to be the Lord's saying that we're going to get these branches and we're going to burn them that they cumber that they cumber not. Uh, so that they may not cumber the ground of my vineyard. Okay, so what does this mean? Cumber. Google says it means to hinder, obstruct, or burden. So these wicked people are like weeds that need to be destroyed, or they will come back with a vengeance and hinder any righteous progress of the people. But wait, the Lord loves everybody. Why would he want to harm anyone? Right? Second Nephi verse 30, uh, sorry, Second Nephi 30 verse 10. And the time speedily cometh that the Lord God shall cause a great division among the people, and the wicked will he destroy, and he will spare his people. Yea, even if it so be that he must destroy the wicked by fire. First Nephi 4.13 Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Okay. <clears throat> so verse 10. Verse 10. And it came to pass that the Lord of the servant of the vineyard, oh sorry, it came to pass that the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did according to the word of the Lord of the vineyard and grafted in the branches of the of the wild olive tree. Okay, so Israel was the first kingdom to get wasted, right? And they got wasted by the Assyrians. Okay. So there were heaps of things that happened. A lot of the Assyrians were destroyed. Uh, sorry, a lot of the Israelites were destroyed, right? Because of the Assyrians. Um, a lot of them were scattered, some stayed, and heaps of them were carried away. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, so that's the young and tender branches. I don't think so. If you carry away 10 tribes, I don't think it's it's just a small group of people. It was heaps of these branches, let's just say. Um, but you could say what was left, at least my understanding would be, the ones that were left and the ones that were carried away were the ones that the Lord could still work with. Okay. So once that happened and once that took place here in verse 10, we've got the Gentiles that were brought or grafted into Samaria around about 721 BC onwards. Okay. So there wasn't just one sort of uh, carrying away. There was, there was a few different waves, right? But the main ones that happened were around about 740 and then 721. And then from 721 onwards, the Gentiles were brought in, right? And that's here in verse 10. Let's find out where that is in the scriptures. 2 Kings 17, verses 24 all the way through to 28. Um, real interesting stuff here, by the way. Listen to this. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Qatar and from Ava and from... I'm probably botching all of these words, by the way. And from Hamath. And from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. Right? So you see the grafting. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them. It's like, whoa, whoa wouldn't want to be there. Which slew some of them. 26, wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. So think about this. These are, these are Gentiles. These guys had no idea about the God of Israel, right? They had no idea about Jehovah. They had no idea about the teachings. But even they believed. They 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 attributed the lions to the God of the land. So it just goes to show what's the difference in the state of these branches. The Israelites, these guys are idiots. They had everything. 
and still they wouldn't listen. Whereas these Gentile branches were grafted in and the first thing they saw was lions and they were like, whoa, we attribute you, Mr. Lion, because of the God of the land. And so they start complaining to the king. So then what does the king do? Verse 27, then the king of Assyria commanded saying, carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence and let them go and dwell there and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Question guys, who is doing the work of the Lord here? Is it the Israelites? Or is it the Gentiles? Verse 28. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. So you can see from that point onwards, they were learning the ways of the God of Israel because they believed straight away. Straight away, right? And it wasn't just it wasn't just um, them, it was even the king. Even the king believed to an, to an extent that he was to go and bring, go and bring, um, or allow one of the priests to go back and to teach the people. So how much, how much access they had to these roots or these covenants, right? That's debatable. But they were starting to be grafted and they were starting to be taught. There was a temporal graft that were moved into that land, right? And then there is a beginning of a spiritual graph where they're starting to be taught the ways. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Verse 11. And the Lord of the vineyard caused that it should be digged about and pruned and nourished. Once again, you can see the same work. Okay. Let's let's dig about it. Let's reestablish the covenant. Let's prune it. Let's do whatever we need to do to, to these people to put them in a state to be, uh, to be humble and to... You know, to, to turn to the Lord, even if it so be we send lions among them, you know, and then let's nourish them. Let's give them profits. Let's give them uh, ways to be able to grow on the tree. Right. Saying unto the, his servant, it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. Wherefore, that perhaps I might preserve the roots thereof, that they perish not, that I might preserve them unto myself. I have done this thing. OK, so. The Gentiles were grafted in for a purpose. The purpose was because Israel was wicked. And another purpose was, was to preserve the roots, to preserve covenants, to preserve um, not not just not just that, but to also preserve the tree. OK, <clears throat> verse 12, wherefore go thy way, watch the tree and nourish it according to my words. So the servant has stewardship over this tree for this period of time. Verse 13. And these will I place in the nevermost part of my vineyard, whithersoever I will. It mattereth not unto thee, and I do it, that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree, and also that I may lay up fruit thereof against the season unto myself. For it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. So, um... My words. <clears throat> First of all, this is the scattering. Okay, this is where the scattering took place. Um, there was scattering here, but I, I, I attribute this verse here to a main scattering that took place roughly around about this period of time, and I'll show you why. Uh, first off, let's let's go into a few of my words. Preserve it unto myself the natural branches. Okay. So the purpose of the scattering is to preserve the natural branches. Israel and Judah were both on a spiritual trajectory for becoming fully ripe and hence facing the wrath of God. The scattered, the scattering may have come as a result of spiritual apostasy, but ultimately it was a blessing to preserve God's covenant people and give them the proper chance to work righteousness and receive his blessings. Right? Um... And then I've got House of Israel scattered by the Lord 610 and then 587. So these guys these guys were, were destroyed and scattered 740 and then 720, right? The Gentiles were brought in. The house of Judah or the kingdom of Judah was still intact. Assyria 
came down to try and smash these guys as well, but they 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 held him off, right? The Lord had a lot of promises and a lot of covenants with Judah because Judah was a little bit different than than um than Israel. And I'll I'll show I'll show in a little bit what I mean by that. But eventually Judah stuffed it up as well. And so we know that this is where Lehi ties into this period of time, right? But there are a few more events that tie into this period as well. So we've got the 10 tribes convoy out of Assyria at 16. We've got Judah that's scattered by 587. Lehi leaves Jerusalem at 600 BC. So we know for, for sure, 100% lock this in, guys, that a young and tender branch was taken and removed from Israel or from the tree at 600 BC. Was he removed from the covenant? No, he wasn't. He was removed, right? And it was a temporal, it was a temporal uh, removal. And so he was removed from from that people and taken over to um, to America, right? And then planted there. So obviously there was that ten year layover where they were in the wilderness chilling, right? But eventually they make it to the Americas, and then Mulek taken by the hand of the Lord. In 587 BC, right before um, Judah is is stuffed up as well. Okay, so um, the last little part, First Nephi 22, verse 4. And behold, there are many who are already lost from the knowledge of those who are at Jerusalem. Yea, the more part of all the tribes have been led away, and they are scattered to and fro upon the isles of the sea, and whither they are, none of us knoweth save that we know that they have been led away. So when it talks about the scattering, there's a scattering and it's also a scattering from the knowledge. So so Jerusalem, um, the Judah, they got, these guys were the record keepers, right? And so we've got the um, we've got the Bible, which is a record of the Jews. They were the they were the record keepers and a lot of the tribes of Israel, a lot of the scattering that took place, they became lost to the knowledge. They became scattered from the knowledge of the record keepers. Okay, <clears throat> and this had happened at this by this period of time, and these guys had um, in the Book of Mormon was they attributed this to about uh, 588 to 570 BC, which also ties in close to this time period here. Okay, so at that stage in First Nephi 22, they had been. They had already a lot of them been taken away, right? All right, so cool. That's that's that section, verses one to fourteen. Hopefully, it gave you guys a bit of a breakdown. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, right? Because I know now I'm trying to keep these videos to an hour, but there's just so much stuff to cover. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm not going to go into depth on this. If you guys want, if you guys want this. <clears throat> If you want this to do your own studies and to go a bit more deeper into, you can um, get a copy of it. I'll put my email in the link below, and you guys can get a copy of it in a in a JPEG. You can zoom in as much as you want and get all the detail and all my notes. Okay. Okay. So let's just go through a, a a rough rough overview of what we've covered. So we've got the period of judges. Then they want a king because they're too cool. They want to be like everyone else. So so Samuel through the Lord anoints King Saul right he's anointed as the king I've put here these are different colors for the kings these are all the kings right this this yellow color are righteous kings this brown color are kings that maybe started out righteous and then they stuffed it up right and then these red colors are the wicked kings so let me just say this was it a good idea to have kings if you if there were kings where would you want to go which side would you want to be on <laughs> you don't want to be on this side that's for sure it's no wonder why they got stuffed up earlier look at look at look at what they did not one but look on this side these guys had a fighting chance this is why i believe they 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 got wasted a little bit later because they got to a point of no return as well Okay, but let's let's break it down. So you got King Saul, uh, one thousand ninety-five BC, King David. 
1047 BC and in King Solomon 1015 BC okay these green ones are the um, are the prophets at the time and I just want to say let, let's let's just cover the the pruning cover the pruning let's cover the um, the digging about and the nourishing okay if you want to know how did the Lord prune his people the Lord's method of pruning right this this was it here Look, you've got the kingdom of Israel up here. You've got the kingdom of Judah down here. You've got this literally surrounded by pruning opportunities. People or tribes or kingdoms that were ready to, to insert their authority over these kingdoms just to put them in a state of being obedient to the Lord. And the Lord used these guys. And you think, okay, well, is there a pattern here? Well, look at the Book of Mormon. What did the Lamanite, what was their role? The exact same thing. It was to stir, it was to stir the Nephites up in remembrance. And you see that eventually these guys, the, the, the Nephites didn't learn their lesson. They did the same thing that ancient Israel did, right? So anyways, so you got the Phoenicians up here, you got the Assyrians the other, all the way up here, the Ammonites, the Moabites, you got the, the Edomites, the um. Egypt was down here. You got the Philistines. Later on, the Babylonians were over here, and they started taking up. They started growing their empire up here, and then expanding out to the kingdom of Judah eventually. But um, any one of these, the Lord used to to prune His people and put them in a state of humility to be obedient. All right. Um, and then and then through through his prophets his servants he distributed the words and the covenants okay so you can see down the middle uh, these ones up here and then also down the middle all of these prophets that were that were assigned and called to bring the kingdoms or the people or the tree into repentance right to change their ways all right cool so uh divided kingdom after solomon the sun went down to Judah, and then Jeroboam uh, took took Israel in the north, the northern, and then created the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Right. So now we've got two kingdoms, and it was Ahijah that actually prophesied this. But ten tribes were to go to the north, and then two tribes were to go to the south and become the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, so Judah and Benjamin went down south, and then all of these ten tribes up here went to um to the north i've put these in color because these guys have the birthright all right so ephraim ephraim the northern kingdom of israel was also called the kingdom of ephraim because ephraim ephraim had that they were like one of the largest tribes they had the authority and also um they carried the birthright they were the birthright tribe okay all right so i'm not going to dive into any of the district descriptions but these are little descriptions uh, or my summaries about a lot of these kings but um i just want to cover real quick on israel look at the kingdom of israel right these guys literally stuffed it up time and time again they just wouldn't listen okay prophets came to them over and over again and they just wouldn't listen this guy jehu he in 884 bc he's he's different the reason why he's different was because he was anointed king under elisha right so what he did is he you could say he's a man he came in and he killed he killed off this guy Jer jehoram jehoram um and then also wing wounded king ahaziah of judah right so there was a bit of a a bit of a pack going on between the two jehu stepped in and he killed this guy and stuffed up this guy who eventually died right because of the wickedness right uh killed so wounded king Isaiah of judah in the name of jehovah and killed the descendants of ahab and killed all of athaliah's athaliah's family uh we'll talk about her probably in a bit got rid of idol worship and there was no record of his death so although he wasn't um always righteous i guess the intent was for for the lord to step in and really get these guys back on track right but um it was a struggle they couldn't get rid of idolatry 
idolatry plagued these guys for for years right and one of the things that the that the prophets were teaching them was guys don't mix and mingle with other other tribes don't mix and mingle with these other guys here because they don't worship the god of um israel they don't worship jehovah these guys have their own gods these guys have their own statues and whatever crazy stuff baal and all that sort of stuff that they worship don't mix with them right but did they listen nah and every time they didn't listen all of those influences were brought in and these guys um perished because of it right last one last one here on Hosea, uh, Hosea 730 to 721 BC he's the last king of Israel right and he's killed eventually but um there was it was interesting because there was something that was extended this this guy got he got an olive leaf extended to him or an olive branch right they they were already by this guy onwards and you could see even before they were already under um, Assyrian power they were a vassal nation to the Assyrians because these guys weren't listening these guys these guys were just wouldn't listen okay and then um, Hosea came along and all he had to do was to surrender to the Assyrians and to pay in heavy tribute but instead this clown sought the aid, aid of Egypt against the Assyrians to relieve the heavy burden. So he was trying to break his own way out, right? The Assyrians came on them because the Lord allowed it to do the Lord's work because these guys wouldn't listen. So this intrigue insulted and uh, resulted in a three-year siege of the northern kingdom and the collapse of Israel. Okay, so um, we've got Second Kings 17 verse 4. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to um, to So king of Egypt, and brought no present to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Okay, so these guys had um, they had broken their promise to the Assyrians, and because of that the Assyrians stepped in and smash them this is a, 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 a image of them right here okay so that this is that period of time where the Israel uh, Israel the Assyrians come into Israel smash them right and then every one of these tealish color boxes this is the scattering that happened right amongst these people at this time so a lot of them were taken and were brought into Assyria they didn't kill them because they wanted their skills they wanted their expertise and to bring those things into assyria because it helped them it helped them to grow in their empire okay and that's how they did it back in the day um some israelites escaped and these became like little little lost remnants um a lot of these branches these main branches were were destroyed so they were plucked off and cast into the fire some Israelites stayed behind, so you've got to understand not everyone left. There were there were a, a few that stayed behind, but a lot of the ones that stayed behind were the weak ones. They were the ones that that maybe you could say were like the more to middle to lower class Israelites that stayed behind. And some of them fled fled to Judah. So you gotta you gotta understand why was Lehi in, in the kingdom of Judah? He was from he was from um, Manasseh. Right, as, as well as Ishmael, he was from um, Ephraim. So why were they there? Well, because most likely, right, they were up here, and at some stage, anywhere along this period of time, they were like, "Nah, man, this is crazy. We got to get out of this. This place is just these people are just you know they're ripe for destruction. We we got to get out of here." And so they went over to uh, to Judah. Okay. Right, cool. So these guys were taken out. The Gentiles were brought in. Okay. Now to um, to the kingdom of Judah. This one here is a little bit different, right? There were prophecies that were laid out that says that on the kingdom of Judah, right, there was going to be the throne of David. And this kingdom was going to be a, an unbroken line of... Um, this Davidic line 
of people who are um, descendants from David that were going to sit on this throne, right? A lot of us know ultimately that Christ was to be the one to sit on the throne of David. A lot of the, in the New Testament, a lot of these people, they were right by saying that, that Christ was going to sit on the throne of David because he had every right to. But um, And that's by lineage too as well, by the way. But um, they, their timing was off, right? They, they had their timing off. But this, this chain here is an unbroken chain of uh, most most of the time it's father son <clears throat> where um, the, there is an heir to the throne right so we're going to go through that so yeah, Rehoboam once again uh, introduced idol worship and then every one of these red ones was pretty much idolatry and it was just getting worse and worse you did have some hope Asa came along you had Je uh, Jehoshaphat he came along and they they really started to turn it around and they got hold they got hold of this whole idol worship and they were able to get rid of it right but it happened at the top it didn't happen at the bottom these guys these guys with their authority in their kingdom they started to get rid of it right <clears throat> and so oh it's like wow there's some hope here um so we got up into a point until we um, got to Joram in 893 BC son he was the son of Jehoshaphat so idolatry wife threatened to break the royal line of David so Ahaziah right and then we had Athaliah so Ahaziah was the son of Joram and then we had this this lady this crazy crazy person called Athaliah <clears throat> She, she, I've called her the queen of the devil. <laughs> she really was a piece of work. But she was married to this dude, right? And she came over from from here. She was uh, the daughter of Ahab, Ahab, right? But Ahab, Ahab had married a Gentile, right? So they're, they're, she's starting to bring in her Gentile authority to try and take over Judah, right? <clears throat> so she's like an imposter, that's managed to make her to weasel her way in into the kingdom of Judah. And what was her intention? It was to break this line, this unbroken chain. So what did she do, right? When this guy died, right, and he was wicked. When he died, and then also Ahaziah, the son died, so her son died. She was like, okay, sweet, I'm going to step in and I'm going to take, I'm going to take over this throne. <coughs> Excuse me. So, mother of Ahaziah, daughter of Ahab, of Israel. After her son was killed, she killed all her grandchildren so that she could seize the throne. The youngest heir was saved miraculously by a righteous priest and hidden in the temple so that the royal Davidic line could be preserved. So, you got to understand, man, this, this lady's something else, man. She's, she's crazy. <laughs> she's crazy, right? Eventually... Eventually, a lot of people found out about this hidden son, right? That was preserved because all of all of um, Ahaz Ahaziah's children were killed off by by Ahaziah's mother. I Meaning she killed all the grandkids. One was saved by a guy or by a priest and was raised in the temple in secret, and she didn't know about it. When when the people found out about it. She, um, that kid grew up and became heir to the throne and then obviously got the throne and then she was killed off what a witch anyways <clears throat> um, Joash, Jehoash and Messiah so a lot of these people were wicked um, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh Manasseh, just so you know guys I'm not named, I didn't name my channel after this guy this guy, this guy man, he was something else he sacrificed his son, right? These guys were starting to do child sacrifice, sacrificing their own kids, right? Um, Josiah was the last hope, and then from that way, from that point on, it was all downhill, until Zedekiah, right? So Zedekiah was around the time of Lehi. We have in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon picks up in the time of Zedekiah, right? And and the Lord said to Lehi, Lehi, go out and start preaching to the people. 
and then they sought to destroy him. Why did they seek, seek to destroy him? Because they were in that state of, oh, you guys are reaching the state of no return. <clears throat> right, so Zedekiah was an interesting case. Um, Jeremiah 38, verses 17 and 18. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and the city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. And they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. Okay? These are my words. You are in bondage, mate. And there is no escape except you submit yourself to the king of Babylon. So the lesson, prophets are always going to ask you to do crazy stuff that might not make any sense. Just listen and obey. Don't be cool like Zedekiah. I, I brought that up because I thought it was interesting. A lot of people, even today, right, members of the church, we 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 get this idea like the prophet would never ask us to do something like take a vaccine. The prophet would never ask us to do something like take wear a mask or whatever. Like forget the fact that there are corrupt people that are running the world. Forget the fact that there are getting into robbers that are doing their thing. Forget that crap, right? The prophet is always the one you want to follow. Okay, so what did, what did, what did, um, what did our old mate um, Zedekiah do? Did he listen? No, he didn't listen. And because he didn't do this this thing of bowing to another king, the king of Babylon, what happened, guys? Well, we know, right? We know what happened. They were stuffed up, right? <clears throat> they got wasted. The wicked Jews were destroyed. And they were plucked off and cast into the fire. A few Jews escaped the land. So were scattered. These scattered remnants. Right? Lehi obviously leaves. He leaves Jerusalem and then returns um, and gets Ishmael. So that's Joseph. These are the tribes of Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh. These are fulfilling covenants, right? That were spoken about in Genesis to Joseph. Okay? So they arrived in promised land uh, roughly 10 years later. That's one... Of the young and tender branches so a young and tender branch can represent two families that's it right doesn't represent um, an entire tribe it could represent a person that represents that tribe for example okay <clears throat> and then you also got Mulek which flees Jerusalem and he's from Judah right as well so we're gonna um, end Zedekiah here okay but um, the story continues and it gets pretty interesting so, so anyways, to finish off, um, I've tied, I've tied that scattering, the, where are we at? The scattering. This verse here, verse 13, I've tied the scattering to this period of time because it wasn't just Babylon, uh, sorry, um, the Babylonians that came in and smashed the Jews and scattered these guys at this time. It wasn't just, um, a scattering that happened on on this side for this kingdom it was actually around the same period of time that there was movement amongst the kingdom of israel which no longer was the kingdom of israel but these guys were in assyria so what happened at the same time roughly 610 to 587 bc <clears throat> what happened was that um because these these guys the babylonians this is the um the exile right here but because the Babylonians had come and smashed these guys because of their wickedness, right? They started to take power around this period of time as well. And they were expanding their kingdom to the point where they started to um, take over these guys. They started to take over the Assyrians. The Assyrians started to lose power because they grew too fast. And a lot of their strength was um, died in the wars. So the, the Babylonians came in and took power over them. At that same time, where are the ten tribes? They're stuck in there, right? They're still in there, chilling, and becoming and were a part of the Assyrian people. They took that as an opportunity to be like, okay, well, I guess no one's taking care of us anymore. Let's uh, <laughs> it's just like a prison cell where the doors open and the keys are left there and the guards are gone. 
it's like all right well i guess this is our cue guys let's let's head on out of here right so at this period of time there was some more scattering that took place so many israelites um i'll say many some israelites stayed in assyria some of them took off and just became just scattered right families scattered along the way uh, but the 10 tribes, they convoyed out of Assyria at this period of time. So they crossed the river Euphrates and took up, took off up north and became lost to the records. The Lord took these branches, right? And there's, this is pretty much a huge chunk of the tree, right? Um, of the natural tree that was taken away from the Lord, right? Now, whether whether these guys constitute the, the young and tender branches, I don't think so, right? The young and tender branches, to me, is Lehi, right? And we've got some other branches here. And we'll know that a lot of you that have studied this this allegory know that there were only a few branches that the Lord spoke speaks about, like three or four, right? Does that represent the entire house of Israel? No, it doesn't. Anyway, so moving back, the ten tribes took this opportunity to convoy out of Assyria and they crossed the river and then they shot off up north and became lost, right? So, many historians speculate on dates when 10 tribes left Assyria. Perhaps the fall of Assyria afforded the captives the opportunity to escape. Um, in the period from 614 to 610 BC, the army of the Medes under Syaxeres, man, honestly, I'm probably botching all of these words, overran all of the territory of the Assyrians, including the areas of Hala and Gozan, where many of the captives had been settled. This was the end of the Assyrian Empire. Subsequently, some of the peoples held captive by Assyria migrated. This migration seems to have been underway by the early part of the 6th century. For at that time, Nephi wrote, Behold, there are many who are already lost from the knowledge of of those who are at the, who are at Jerusalem, yea, the more part of all the tribes have been led away. Um, that's that one verse in First Nephi 22 that I spoke about earlier, and that's from Enzyme 1982, Israel's other tribes. Okay, so that's why I I um I attribute the scattering to this period of time. Right now, um, before we end up, we know that um that eventually. Judah hasn't finished, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot more work that's taken place amongst Judah, but Israel, these guys, these guys are well and truly scattered, and then the ten tribes uh, um, have shot off. So, articles of faith. This is Joseph Smith, verse ten. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. That Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent that Christ will reign personally upon the earth and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. Okay. That is this. That's the undoing of all of this and bringing us all back together. Remember guys, we're not just a family in this life. Israel wasn't a family that was, um, that came because because of who we were in the life prior to coming here as well right um i want to end with my testimony brothers and sisters i know i love the lord and i love the scriptures and i know that when we study the scriptures properly that so much truth and wisdom and knowledge is revealed to us um i'm hoping that by going through these verses it gives you a bit of understanding about how i do my work um, once again, I'm not saying I'm perfect in my work, but but I, I really love the scriptures and I know that they are the word of God. I know that when we plant that word in us, it has the ability to change us, to change our natures and help us to become who the Lord wants us to become so that eventually we can return to be with him. Um, I know that the church is true. I know that the scattering and the get the gathering of Israel in which we're a part of is the most important work that we could be a part of right and I leave that with you guys in the name of Jesus Christ amen all right that's that's a wrap guys I'll see you on the next video